During the night of July 25th and 26th of 2010, a 50-year-old pipeline transporting oil near Talmadge Creek in southwestern Michigan ruptured. Most of us knew there were pipelines in our area and they were silently delivering crude oil, but we really didn't know much about them for all the years they were there. Um, that all changed in July 2010, it changed forever. How I actually found out about the spill was on TV that morning, the morning of the spill. Crews are now scrambling to contain this spill, Tony. Brian, a couple updates for you. We just heard word that there is a no fishing, no swimming advisory for waterways in this affected area. We know that there is oil in the Kalamazoo River, not only a sheen on the surface, but you can also see vegetation and plants along the banks have been stained with that oil. If executives from the company that runs that pumping station and bridge energy, top executives are said to be flying into Battle Creek area, into Calhoun County. Here at the live desk right now, and we're working to give you more perspective on that oil spill. Enbridge says that they consider any spill of more than five gallons to be significant. The race continues to clean up the massive oil spill traveling through the Kalamazoo River. Today, Enbridge Energy, the company that owns the failed 30-inch pipeline, says they are doubling their workforce. The EPA is also ramping up its presence here. Huge mess, this big disaster. And depending on what they find out when it comes to air quality and perhaps some long-term effects, we may see other families have to relocate as well. The day of the spill, I responded um, just to see what was going on with the river and the fishery and have been involved with it ever since for 10 years. Being in mid-Michigan, you never thought you'd have to deal with a huge oil spill. I mean, you hear of that like on the oceans and things like that. So when it happened, I had no idea what to expect. I thought it would be total fish kill devastation. I would say as a resident who lives here, I was heartbroken when it happened, really devastated it, and I didn't think it would ever recover. The river has played a, a great part in our history, not only our tribe, but other tribes. A big correlation, you know, with the wild rice and uh, the rivers and our way of life in general. Culturally speaking, as Anishinaabe people, you would get your food from the river, you would get your hygiene from the river, you would get your transportation from the river. You have to go to the source to, to, to gain this knowledge. Our work early on was to facilitate the EPA's you know, requirements of Enbridge really just ensuring that our state settlement with Enbridge, our consent judgment is followed. The design of that settlement agreement was very difficult. It was took a long time to reach. Letting them do their job, but also making sure the state rules and regulations were being followed was to make sure that, you know, natural resource damages were maintained at a minimum at that point. So that, you know, you don't get to the point where the cure is worse than the disease because there is a point of diminishing return. So as Enbridge was doing their response work, a lot of woody material was removed for boat access, dredging. When they would remove woody material, they would GPS points and they would take a, a minimum amount of information about what it was, how large it was, and that database was our starting point. But there was, I believe, over 3,500 recorded pieces of wood material that were removed, we couldn't possibly restore all of it. Clean logs and stumps were installed to replace shelter and basking habitat for fish, turtles, and other species that live in the river. The final EPA-directed dredge operation of large scale finished in 2014, and that's what at least allowed our activities to be geared more toward the restoration of all the impacts, because there were impacts from the spill itself as well as the response to the spill. One of the tribe's greatest uh, losses right after the release was the river being shut down. And there are uh, tribal members that rely upon the river for sustenance. This section of river between Marshall, down through Battle Creek to Galesburg, it only had a couple of access sites. After the spill and because of the, the fact that it was shut down for so long, one of the mitigation factors was to create new access sites and improved access, access sites. So they constructed and improved five new access sites. 
If people use the river, I think they're going to be better advocates for the river. Getting these new people out because of these access sites and the improvement and recreation opportunity, you know, my fingers crossed that they will become advocates and will help fight for this river to clean up past the problems and to make sure that we don't have issues in the future. The tribe had an existing program to restore wild rice to the Kalamazoo River. The Kalamazoo River is essential to our traditional life way and is the core of our traditional territory. Wild rice is not only a, a food staple, but it was also a staple of, of wildlife habitat and traditional culture. There's actually a traditional rice culture. Our wild rice within southern Michigan tends to be the uh, wild river rice and it's associated with the uh, river tributaries and the main channel of the Kalamazoo. It's been greatly di diminished in recent years, and it's a very difficult resource to restore. Well, a million gallons of oil uh, put that restoration on hold. It's my understanding that we're one of the leading uh, tribes in restoration of wild rice, and I'm consuming, it's just not throw it in the water, okay, it works, then <laughs> no, it don't work that way. <laughs> One of the organisms that concerns the tribe the most is, of course, uh, turtles. Turtles are of great cultural significance to the tribe, and we don't know the full impact. I believe it's the case that we are missing an entire generation uh, because they were not laying eggs during the cleanup. In our Anishinaabe culture, we have original clan. The fish water clan is, is one of those original clans. King of that clan is the turtle. But these families of turtles in that region right there, it definitely will affect them. any family of animal, human who loses a, a loved one. They, they grieve in their own way. We may not know what that way is, but they do. It comes to the wildlife recovery, very little knowledge out there regarding freshwater spills. Most of it all uh, would have to do with marine spills. When the spill occurred in late July, we had our, our field guys out there collecting as many turtles as they can. We used a variety of different trapping techniques. We had felt that any turtle out there has been exposed to oil in some way. We don't know, let's collect it, let's take it back to this rehab facility. And so a turtle would come in, all the animals were photographed, they were given an initial assessment to see how oiled they were. But the animal would go through kind of an initial soak in a, a mix of some Dawn dish soap and water. Um, the cleaning process would start. And so that's where dozens and dozens and dozens of volunteers, local people, uh, to help to clean these animals. And, you know, without, without them, like, I, I don't know what would have happened because somebody would just sit there meticulously just scrubbing at the turtle, getting on all the little cracks. Um, and then after an hour, it would have to be put back uh, in its container to rest. You know, maybe it took a day, maybe it took two or three cleanings to get all the, the oiling off that individual turtle. They had a, a variety of vets that were helping out. The vet staff would monitor and keep a look at, at that individual. We eventually got to a point where we were collecting 100 turtles a day that were impacted by the oil. We didn't want to keep these animals in a captive setting for longer than they needed to. However, there was still so much oil in portions of the river that we felt it wouldn't be safe to release them back there. The Fish and Wildlife and, and DNR came up with a variety of locations within the same watershed, finding locations that were of similar habitat to where the animal had come from. Turtles have such a high degree of site fidelity, meaning they know where home is. They want to get back to home, that we wanted to release them in a location that they could potentially eventually come back if, if they really wanted to. We were doing our thing and we were cleaning the turtles and you felt good that you were able to clean them and put them back there. But, you know, the thing that really kind of gnaws at your brain is what's going to happen to the turtle? One of the things that I think about a lot as I'm out on the river is the amount of effort that went into the cleanup, went into the rehabilitation specifically of turtles. And I wonder a lot of times, does that matter? Did that matter? Enough of the ones that you saw that were so heavily oiled that actually came in dead, it makes you think that, yes, don't do anything, they're probably going to perish. A really great thing to see is now eight, 10 years after the fact, and I'm recatching turtles that we had caught in 2010. 
that we had cleaned up, that we had marked so that I know that this individual had gone through a plethora of cleaning, uh, may have been overwintered, and we released it back out there. And here the animal is. It's got a larger shell. It weighs more. So I know that all of that work that we did was worthwhile. And then in addition to that, you know, you start to worry about, oh, if you're putting animals in an area that they're unfamiliar with, are they even going to survive? Well, what I'm seeing now is animals that we released, say 30 uh, kilometers upriver, 30 kilometers downriver, have come back. Like I'm actually catching those animals almost exactly in the same location that they were caught 10 years ago, which is, it's phenomenal, like how they were able to figure out either coming downriver or upriver and getting back into that location. And so seeing that, you know, makes you really realize that it was a very worthwhile venture uh, cleaning up the river and cleaning these particular individuals. Even though they did a good job of restoring, you go to that area, you can tell that the vegetation in that area where it was restored is different than the surrounding area. If you know what you're looking for, you can tell the difference. Hopefully lessons learned that the, the company will uh, improve their procedures to better safeguard the environment. Like I said, we knew pipelines existed but never really gave much thought as to an occurrence of a leak, nor did we believe it could be so disastrous as a million gallons of crude oil along 35 miles of the Kalamazoo River. Well, now we know. Uh, we have a greater level of awareness, and, and that was one of the greatest lessons we learned. We do not know the full impacts of the river. I hear people say, it's look at all the green vegetation, look at all the turtles. I think that lulls us into a bit of a false belief that the river is restored. We don't know the full impact. The ecosystem as an entirety, we don't know the impact on the full watershed. Uh, the full human impact may not ever be known. It certainly helps to get back on the river and catch your fish and paddle it. Seeing the healing helps a lot too. My ultimate would be for it not to be there. Then we don't even have to worry about it. And if they want to continue to have that pipeline, you know, we, we got to learn lessons. This can happen, and it'll happen again. We need to be prepared. Let's see the, the response money up front. And the worst thing that we would want to hear is, oops, we got a leak, but we can't afford it. Then what? You know, you can stand there and look at it and see, you know, restored vegetation. But what you don't see is the chemical insult. It's not for anyone to be able to say yet what the long-term impacts might be. And of course, there's an emotional toll, the impact on the community that is difficult to measure as well. The biggest takeaway for me, and one of the things I was most impressed with early on, was the ability of a community to come together very quickly and in an organized fashion. It was a heavy lift, and it's nice to be part of something positive. You know, once you start seeing things start to heal, it, it feels really nice. It's never gonna be the same but it, we're trying to make it as healthy as we possibly can. 10 years and over a billion dollars later, the Kalamazoo River is healing. Yet scars remain, and time will tell what the long-term outcomes will be. For the Anishinaabe people, this spill will be remembered forever through the story of the Great Stain.